Some people today speak in bigoted terms of white power or black power. Some people obsess over green power and off-grid power. The earth-worshipping, tree-hugging climate warriors fixate on renewable power and carbon-free power. The science engineers have split the atom and can deliver nuclear power. In this life, we daily struggle against personal powers and social media power and civil powers and corporate powers and religious powers and governmental powers and demonic powers. But Jesus has incomparable power. He has unimaginable power. He has uncontestable power. He has immeasurable power. He has promise-keeping power. He has loving power. He has grave-conquering power. He has death-defeating power. He has sin-wiping power. He has never-ending, omnipotent power. Follow along with me from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, reading from verse 13. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow, as others who have no hope. Many Christians simply will not invest the time needed to gain a good grounding in end times prophecy. I'm not suggesting every believer must become a prophecy expert, but notice Paul's words here. I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren. This is a common theme in Scripture. God does not want us to be ignorant of end times prophecy. Depending on how you do the count, 15% or more of the Bible has prophetic truth relating to our future. This is one of the main themes of the Word of God. God expects, commands, that we not be ignorant of Bible prophecy, a primary teaching contained throughout. Paul was only with the Thessalonian newborn believers for three weeks, and it's clear he'd spent considerable time teaching them on second coming prophecy. The first coming of Jesus was an event that took place over about 33 years. We have records of things that happened before his birth, in his younger years, at the start of his ministry, in the middle of his ministry, at the end of his ministry, in the week before his execution, whilst he lay in the grave, and for 40 days after his resurrection. There were prophecies in the Old Testament about each of these phases of his earthly existence. But it was impossible for mortal men and even angels to accurately and comprehensively understand how these prophecies would play out before the appointed time. There were numerous ways the rabbis interpreted these many varied and seemingly contradictory messianic prophecies. All sorts of erroneous theories were postulated by the Jews in an attempt to make sense of the messianic prophecies and promises. So the first coming of Jesus describes a 33-year period of history. The second coming of Jesus describes a period of time of over 1,000 years to play out in our future. There are prophecies describing events just before his second coming, soon after the commencement of his second coming, in the middle of his second coming, at the end of his second coming, and events that take place after the completion of his second coming. As with his first coming, until the events of his second coming play out, we cannot comprehensively and fully understand every detail of every second coming prophecy. It shouldn't surprise us today. All sorts of fantastical theories are postulated by the religious class of elites, theologians, high critics, experts, doctors of theology, a new professional class of Balaamites who've monetized the gospel and turned the word of God into a luxurious trough of gold for their snouts to gorge upon. They've presented a new and imaginative, brilliant but erroneous wave of liberal, allegorical, super spiritualized, compromised reinterpretations of the many Bible prophecies relating to the second coming of Christ. We're in a far more enlightened place today to understand the second coming prophecies compared with the Jews prior to the first coming of Messiah. We have the history of Jesus fulfilling approximately 300 first coming prophecies 2,000 years ago. Jesus 
methodically fulfilled each of these prophecies with literal precision. We also have the 27 books of the New Testament with extensive additional revelation on his second coming. Plus, we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit to assist us with understanding how our immutable God is consistent in his literal method of fulfilling every last prophecy he made regarding the coming of Messiah. Now let's get to the teaching of Paul in this text about the second coming of Jesus. The physical death of a loved one is a sad event, but if they're part of the family of God, it isn't a sorrow the depth of which is felt by those living outside the hope of Christ. For those not in Christ, death is the beginning of eternal separation, mind-numbing hopelessness and sorrow. But for believers, death is a temporary parting, a glorious reuniting awaits in our near future. Verse 14, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. If we believe. Do you truly believe that Jesus died and rose again? Are you born again in this glorious truth? Is Jesus your only hope of eternal life? Is Jesus your Lord? Is Jesus your Saviour? You know, James teaches us even the demons believe and tremble. Do you believe and rejoice that Jesus died and rose again for you? For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, we know Jesus has the power to raise the dead as he defeated death itself. Some people today speak in bigoted terms of white power or black power. Some people obsess over green power and off-grid power. The earth-worshipping, tree-hugging, climate warriors fixate on renewable power and carbon-free power. The science engineers have split the atom and can deliver nuclear power. In this life, we daily struggle against personal powers and social media powers and civil powers and corporate powers and religious powers and governmental powers and demonic powers. But Jesus has incomparable power. He has unimaginable power. He has uncontestable power. He has immeasurable power. He has promise-keeping power. He has loving power. He has grave-conquering power. He has death-defeating power. He has sin-wiping power. He has never-ending, omnipotent power. And this power will one day be turned to reuniting the dead with new eternal bodies. When Jesus comes back, he's coming with the saints who sleep in him. This will be the day when the saints, past and present, reunite as one in the power of the all-powerful worthy one in the day of his second coming. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Verse 15. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord. This isn't Paul's opinion on the subject. This is a heavenly declaration from the throne room of the Creator. Paul is declaring the word of the Lord. Are you listening? Do you hear the Lord? This is his promise to the saints of God, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. Oh, what a day! What a spine-tingling, jaw-dropping, faith-building, hallelujah, day of glory this will be. One day soon, the time of the second coming of Jesus will commence. Paul succinctly summarises the opening volley of events that commences the time of Jesus' second coming. In an imminent day, millions of saints will bypass death. Earthly, mortal, corruptible life will translate into heavenly, immortal, incorruptible life. But there is an order to these events. We who are alive and remain will not precede those who are asleep. Also notice, Paul expectantly, hopefully, undeniably included himself in this group. We who are alive, not those who are alive. 
we who are alive. Paul lived each day as if Jesus could return any day. Paul lived in the expectation of the imminent return of Christ and it energised how he lived. The imminent return of Christ is an important doctrine of the apostolic church era saints, a doctrine that's all but ignored in the dying denominational churches of the West today. If you declare you believe in the imminent return of Christ, other Christians will openly mock you. If you say the rapture could occur at any moment, as the mighty apostle Paul believed, you'll have a lineup of so-called Christians treating you like a simpleton. Verse 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. The one with unlimited power will himself leave the throne room of heaven, descend into our mortal realm, and shout with a voice that will likely rattle every atom in the universe. This voice, this shout, this sound will stun creation. It's unclear if Paul is describing the voice of Jesus as being likened to an archangel or mirrored by a literal archangel. This cacophony of sound will be victoriously joined with a trumpet or shofar of God roaring simultaneously. This stunning, never-before-heard eruption of sound will instantaneously stir and awake the dead bodies of the saints. What a moment! The dead in Christ will rise first. Jesus will knit together the long-decayed bodies of departed saints. Someone might ask, what if your body is being cremated and your ashes scattered at sea? Jesus will gather those dispersed ashes and recombine them into a new incorruptible body. The dead church era saints will rise in this glorious moment, this wondrous moment, the day of our blessed hope finally realised. And let me tell you, this is no secret coming of Jesus. The scoffers and mockers, straw man, what the Bible teaches, suggesting we literalists teach a secret coming of Jesus. No one teaches a secret coming of Jesus. This event, this rapture, this trumpet blast will very publicly declare the day of Jesus' second coming has commenced. This day will come as a thief in the night to the unsaved, in that it comes when they didn't expect, while they were sleeping, Eyes closed, minds shut off to the possibility of God. But it isn't a secret coming of Jesus. All those left behind will know something incredible, something historic, something stupefying has just occurred. Just as everyone who's been robbed identifies the extent of the loss, but only after the thief has come and gone whilst they were sleeping. Verse 17, Then we who are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. So the dead saints raised and reconstituted, immediately followed by the living saints, translated and altered, the mortal putting on immortality at the command of the living or powerful word of God. Paul is simply adding extra details to the information years earlier taught by Jesus. When Jesus explained, there will be two people in one bed. The one will be taken and the other will be left. Two women will be grinding together. The one will be taken and the other left. Two men will be in the field. The one will be taken and the other left. Outdoors, indoors, sleeping, awake, daytime, nighttime. This blessed moment will take place around the globe. Jesus made this prediction, remember, before the idea of different time zones was even conceived of by men. The rapture will occur at one instant, all around the globe. For some, it'll be during the working day. For others, late at night will be caught up, the dead and living both, to meet the Lord in the air. The English word rapture 
is a transliteration from the Latin Vulgate, rendered in this verse as caught up, as it is in most English translations. Many old Protestant denominational Christians are irrationally triggered by the word rapture. Yes, the rapture is in the Bible, but only if you read the Vulgate. The rapture is most definitely a Bible concept. If you don't like the word rapture, just use the term caught up, or translate it, or harpazo. Apologies to Greek speakers. Whatever you want to call it, in a soon coming day, we're going up to meet Jesus in the clouds. This event is often depicted as believers instantly vanishing. We may instantly disappear. But it's also possible we may be witnessed by others ascending up into the clouds. The Bible describes our change occurring in the twinkling of an eye. That doesn't mean our ascent into the clouds will happen in a twinkling. Think of Elijah. He ascended in a chariot in the presence of Elisha. Or what of Jesus on the Mount of Olives? While the disciples watched, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. Both Elijah and Jesus were watched by others as they were raptured, caught up into heaven. I'd say it's entirely likely millions left behind will personally witness the ascension of the saints into the clouds to meet Jesus in the air. Notice also in this particular second coming event, Jesus doesn't come to earth. This is the saints rising to meet Jesus in the air, in the clouds. Jesus' landing on the Mount of Olives will be at least seven years later in time. Christians argue over the timing of the rapture. Some say the rapture of the saints and the coming to the earth of Jesus happen more or less at the same time. Some teach a mid-tribulation rapture three and a half years before Jesus touches down. Others teach the rapture will occur seven years before Jesus lands. Some even teach a partial rapture of only the godly, super-duper saints. <laughs> a newer position is the pre-wrath view, some unknown period after the abomination of desolation. But I can't see from scriptural evidence that there's any fixed time period between the rapture and either the abomination event or the Mount of Olives landing of Jesus on earth event. The rapture could occur days, weeks, months or years before the commencement of Daniel's 70th week. Though, if you force me to guess, I'd say the seven-year countdown will start weeks or months after the rapture. The 70th week commences with Antichrist signing a seven-year covenant, not with the rapture. My strong advice to listeners, don't listen to date setters. If your favourite prophecy buff has set a date in the past, find someone else to learn from. Date setters are false prophets, dangerous and harmful, bringing discredit and shame to the name of Jesus. Whatever God's timing for the rapture, once it occurs, Paul here assures us from that moment forward, we shall ever be present with the Lord. Verse 18, therefore comfort one another with these words. A beautiful closing exhortation for us believers to live by. The second coming of Jesus will commence with the rapture of the dead and living church era saints. Then over a millennia of prophetic history will play out. All these happenings between the rapture and the great white throne are second coming events. But the opening moment of the second coming is the rapture, our blessed hope. We can comfort one another with the hope of the coming rapture. Our blessed hope isn't that Jesus is going to bash his bride up for seven years prior to the marriage supper of the Lamb. After the rapture will be seven years where the wrath of the Lamb will pour upon the earth dwellers. A time to give rebellious man one final chance to repent before their final eternal destruction. I've heard some rapture deniers call pre-tribbers escapists. I say, guilty as charged. I agree with Jesus' words in Luke 21, 36, when Jesus said, pray always 
that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things. I've also heard frequent straw man arguments by rapture deniers that pre-tribbers like me teach Christians will not face tribulation. We don't teach this. Christians should expect to face tribulation, trials and persecution. The same group mislead by saying no one taught the pre-trib rapture till Derby approximately 200 years ago. False again. Many taught a pre-trib rapture before Derby. Just one example. Investigate Ephraim the Syrian. I've personally read at least 10 pre-tribulation rapture references in his teachings alone, well over a thousand years before Derby's day. This same group of anti-rapturists teach no passage of scripture teaches a rapture, followed by an outpouring of God's wrath and indignation on the left behind earth dwellers. Wrong again. Try reading Isaiah 26, 19 through 21. One final straw man attack leveled at pre-tribbers before we close today. I've heard it repeatedly said, pre-tribbers are setting their followers up for failure if their timing for the rapture is wrong. Wrong again. From my experience, the most devoted studiers of end time events are pre-tribulationists. We study the prophetic events of the second coming like few other Christians. If the rapture doesn't happen pre the final seven years, very few Christians would be better prepared and informed for the coming tribulation than the heavily researched pre-tribulation rapture believing Christians. So, comfort one another with the wonderful blessed hope of the imminent coming of the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. And may God richly bless you all.